Hi, I'm Pastor David Wendell, and this is my sermon for the 21st Sunday of Pentecost, October 22nd, 2023. Before I begin, I'd like to say a word of greeting to all who are viewing this sermon, but especially those of you homebound and shut in for whom this is your only opportunity to hear the word of God preached each week. I ask God to bless you through these sermons, and I, I thank God for the opportunity to bring the Word of God to so many people in so many places. I'd also like to say a special word of greeting to my friends at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Kettle River, Minnesota, and Faith Lutheran Church in Sturgeon Lake, Minnesota, who took the time to send me such a heartfelt thank you card and letter. Blessings to all of you and to each of you. The Gospel reading for this Sunday is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're now living in what can certainly be called the gotcha era of politics, media, and life. Not that there haven't been other times like this in history and in American history when it seems the one goal is to ask the one question which will catch the political or other public figure in such a way that however one answers, he or she will be trapped and there'll be a price to pay. They'll be canceled or discredited or otherwise shamed in such a way that the election will be lost, the Supreme Court nominee will not be confirmed, the TV preacher will lose his multi-million dollar ministry. As a longtime reader of presidential biographies, gotcha questions were not unheard of when George Washington was losing revolutionary battles or Abraham Lincoln couldn't find a general who would fight. But in our day, it seems to have become a career for some, a preoccupation for those who want their one moment in the spotlight when they believe they were solely responsible for bringing down an elected official, a presidential nominee, or an arrogant and self-absorbed celebrity. Probably there were those asking, Gotcha questions of kings and emperors throughout history. But there was surely an advantage when a ruler could just say, off with his head, and no more gotcha questions. Jesus didn't have that freedom as he was being asked gotcha question after gotcha question in his short but eventful life. Now, most probably don't think of the verbal sparring between Jesus and his detractors as akin to our modern-day gotcha interrogations. But isn't that what it was? Again and again, the religious leaders and finally Herod and Pilate tried to trip Jesus up to get him to incriminate himself. If they could only get Jesus to say something which would undeniably bring about his demise, they could wash their hands of this troublemaker who stirred up the people with his talk of the kingdom of God and doing the will of the Father and forgiving not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. 
And none of the gotcha questions were as loaded as the one we hear the Pharisees asking in our gospel reading for today. When these religious leaders thought they finally had Jesus trapped in a brilliant question aimed at pitting the unwitting masses against the all-powerful Roman Empire so that however Jesus answered, they thought, now we'll have him. It'll be lose-lose for Jesus regardless. So what we're hearing in the Gospel of Matthew is a series of gotcha questions asked now by the Pharisees and next by the, by the Sadducees, trying to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they began with an attempt to distract him by flattering him. So in our lesson today, we hear that they sent their associates to him, together with the Herodians, the local government officials, who could bear witness if necessary. And they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and care for no man. For you do not regard the position of men. And then they asked their gotcha question. They said, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now you see the brilliance of the questioning with both religious figures and Herod's people, temple and government right there waiting for Jesus to fall into their trap. If he said pay taxes to Caesar, the people would reject and rebel against him, for no one wanted to pay taxes to Caesar, whom they saw as a pagan ruler with an occupying force in their homeland. Jesus would lose the people if he just said, okay, sure, pay your taxes to this monster whose forces hold you down and control your lives. On the other hand, if Jesus says it's not right to pay taxes to Caesar, the Herodians serving under the puppet ruler Herod would report that and Jesus would be found guilty of disrupting the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, by suggesting that people not obey Caesar and pay the tax man. Either way, they thought they had him. Or so they thought. But Matthew tells us, Jesus, aware of their malice, knowing what they were doing and how they were trying to entrap him, Jesus gave an answer that isn't an answer. First, the Lord says, Why are you trying to test me, you hypocrites, you play actors, as it's translated from the Greek? Then Jesus asked for a Roman coin. Ask them whose image it bears, and when they say Caesar's, he makes a statement which on its face answers the question. Since it was the emperor's face on the coin, and since you're using the coinage of the empire, then yes, pay taxes to Caesar. And in that answer, Christians have from that time on considered that it is right and proper to give earthly rulers their due. It's right and proper to have kings, emperors, presidents, and governments. It's appropriate to pay taxes, really realizing God created this kind of order to establish peace and stability in society, to protect individual God-given rights and freedoms, and to allow citizens in the kingdoms of this world to thrive. Of course, we've struggled from creation on with the reality of rulers who don't see themselves as agents of God, do not understand their power as God-given, and abuse their authority to lord it over their subjects and citizens. But bad rulers don't negate the need for civil authority any more than godless dictators prove that the only alternative is chaos and anarchy. Martin Luther developed an understanding that there are two kingdoms in this life. The kingdom of God, on the one hand, which has to do with mercy, forgiveness, and redemption, loving God and neighbor, and the kingdom of this world, on the other hand, which needs to be governed wisely by people in authority who understand themselves, as did Cyrus in our first lesson, as called by the Lord God to serve and to be accountable. Luther designated the kingdom of this world as the kingdom of the left hand of God and the kingdom of heaven as his right hand. 
God puts people in place to maintain justice and order so that we can give ourselves wholly and freely and safely to love of him and love of our neighbor as trustees of the gifts and blessings of God, redeemed to live in peace and joy by the death and resurrection of God's Son, our Lord Jesus. This is God's plan for our lives and for all of creation. And it grows out of Jesus' own words, Give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And that quieted Jesus' interrogators in our reading, so that they marveled at his response and they went away. And that response at face value gives us a black and white, easily understood rule guiding life and citizenship and why we should pay our taxes. And it's caused Christians around the world at times to be charged with quietism in the face of injustice and governmental abuse of authority. As if Christians just throw up their hands and say, well, God created governments and leaders, so we have to put up with it no matter what. But that kind of response is to, is to miss the depth of meaning in Jesus' words in our gospel account today. Because, yes, there is a justification there for being obedient, orderly citizens. But what does it mean to say, Render to God what is God's. Because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we find real meaning in the words of the Lord today. That's where we find not an easy black and white answer, but instead a question that challenges us in every aspect of life, in our citizenship and our stewardship, in our discipleship and our membership in the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, living and working in the kingdom of this world. For when we look past the face value of Jesus' words, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, we're challenged to go deeper. We begin to sense what our Lord might have been, surely was saying about what is Caesar's and what is God's. If, as we read in our first lesson, even Cyrus, a ruler who worshiped Persian gods, was chosen to be an instrument for the fulfillment of God's plans, then how could we not say that even Cyrus's kingship belonged to God? as did his armies and his wealth, even to the last coin bearing Cyrus's image. While Caesar's image was on his coinage, was his authority not from God? And his Pax Romana, was it not intended by God for the peace and prosperity of Roman subjects? Earthly rulers have not always understood themselves to be agents of God's authority, but that means it's up to, to us as subjects at times to hold our rulers accountable, to demand they respect our unalienable rights, to seek and support leaders who will uphold order and justice for all. Jesus' words today, far from imposing upon us a quietude and an acceptance of all earthly power and authority, regardless, instead lays upon us a burden and a responsibility to see all of life, everything we have and are, as gifts from God entrusted to us as stewards, so that ultimately our bodies and souls and all that is ours our governments, our institutions and structures, our homes and possessions are understood as God's. And so we render to God what is God's, which is everything. Which is an important message for us to hear. You and me as disciples and followers of Jesus affirming our faith, witnessing to our faith today, our faith in the God and Father of us all, in his Son who died and was raised for us 
and for our salvation. Faith in the Holy Spirit, who enlightens and enlivens us as the body of Christ. We are not created and redeemed to live in the church building as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and then to turn around and live out in the world as just citizens of secular society. It's so easy for us today to compartmentalize faith, church, word, and sacraments, allowing the secular world and even government to pressure us into thinking that that religious stuff really belongs within the four walls of the church or the home and only within church or home. And we have at times allowed ourselves to be restrained and constrained. The Lord is reminding us everything, both kingdoms, the left and the right, the church and the world, the spiritual and the mundane, are created by God, belong to God, and are to be rendered, returned to God in response to his love and mercy. We are to live our lives with that in mind as our guiding light, as St. Paul writes, as we serve a living and true God and wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us. We render to God what is God's. We live our lives mindful of the fact that we serve a living and true God, that this God is with us everywhere, in every nook and corner of this world, and that we live every day, giving testimony to the death and resurrection of Jesus who is our Deliverer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.